Hey friends, welcome to our online service. We're thrilled to have you join us for a powerful time of worship, transformative teaching, and a renewed sense of hope. While we deeply value the opportunity to connect virtually, we also want to extend an invitation to experience the joy of gathering in person. Being together in community is vital for spiritual growth, fostering deeper relationships, and sharing life's journey. We would love to have you join us at any of our campuses, as we believe that together, we can experience the fullness of God's love and support one another in our faith walk. As we head to our rock room and campus in just a moment for our service today, whether you're tuning in from the comfort of your home or connecting with us from afar, we invite you to engage wholeheartedly and allow God's presence to fill your surroundings. Well, hello, Woodman, and welcome to church this evening. If I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Lindsay, and I'm on staff here at the Rock Room and Campus as the Community Groups Coordinator. And we are just so grateful and thrilled that you've decided to come and worship the Lord with us today. We're so thrilled that you are here that actually we would love to talk to you, and we have an entire area for that. So if you head out these doors, head down the hallway to the left, you're going to find Connect Central. So if you're new here, if this is your first or second time here, and you haven't swung by Connect Central yet, I strongly encourage you to do so. We would love to hear what brought you to Woodman today, uh, maybe answer questions that you have about Woodman, and if you're a first-time visitor, we even have a gift for you. We would love to talk to you because we are really excited about what God is doing in and around Woodman. So if you're new here, or maybe if you've been here for a while, you can always swing by Connect Central and talk to us. And also, we want to invite you guys to learn more about what Woodman is doing at the Ministry Fair. Uh, August 10th and 11th, as well as the 17th and 18th, we are going to have a Ministry Fair here at the Rock Ramon campus after every weekend service. It's going to be over in the Stone Chapel. And we're going to have booths set up with all of our ministries represented so that you can learn more about opportunities you might have to participate in what God is doing in and around Woodman. We recognize that this is the time of year where you're starting to look at your schedules and think, man, what is the fall going to look like? And so we want to give you some opportunities to maybe step into something that you haven't ever stepped into before, like a community group or a connect group or a Woodman U class. Or maybe there's an opportunity for you to step up and become a ministry partner and serve at the weekend services and help us out here. We are excited about what God is doing in and around Woodman, but we also recognize that God is doing amazing things outside of Woodman. So if you are serving in any sort of ministry outside the walls of Woodman, we would also love it if you came to the ministry fair so we could learn where God has called you to serve. So if you are a teacher, a coach, a businessman, work in the healthcare industry, or serve in a ministry outside of Woodman, swing by the ministry fair so we can find ways to encourage you as you are faithful to what God is calling you to do. God is up to something really good, so we would love to celebrate that at the ministry fair. Again, 10th and 11th and the 17th and 18th after each of the weekend services. If you go to the ministry fair, you're going to hear about things like our Access Ministries. Our Access Ministries is a beautiful ministry that we have for those with special needs in our church. 
where we can provide them a place where they are seen and loved and can participate. We have classes for both students and adults. Uh, we have uh, ministry partners that come alongside and support those with special needs. And periodically, we even provide evenings of respite care for those with special needs so that caregivers can have a couple hours. So if you want to learn about access ministries or any other ministry, again, you can go to Connect Central, you can go to the ministry fair, or you can even scan the QR code that's right there in your pew back. God is up to something good, and we are just so grateful that we can participate in it. And we are excited for him as he is bringing his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And that is worth praising and worshiping his name. So if you can, please stand as we enter our time of worship. Awesome. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, hello, church family. My name is Petra, and I'm one of the worship leaders here at Woodman. And I pray that as you've been preparing your hearts, as you come in over the last hour, um, that you've been preparing your hearts to encounter God and just to um, surrender everything before him, relinquish it to him, and come into this place and praise his name along with your um, fellow church goers. And before, before we worship, and if you haven't already, um, I would encourage you, if you would allow your hearts to be softened now as we read from scripture, together. From Romans 15, 13, it's encouraging. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And in 1 Timothy 2, it says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So church, today with joy and faith and hope, let's sing of the testimony of Jesus, of what he's done for us. Let's sing with joy together today.
who saved us, who rescued us from sin, and who promises an eternity with him, that is the God that we get to follow and surrender to. The one who didn't hold anything back from us, but gave everything so that we could have a relationship with the God of the universe. And Lord, here and now we confess that sometimes it can be scary to give everything to you, to, to surrender to your plans and to your will and to your ways, to let go of our control. But the truth is that there is joy and freedom in bowing before you and allowing you to take the reins and to lead with perfect wisdom, with all authority, with all goodness, 
with all foresight. That is the God that we surrender to. And so we ask that you would help us to surrender to you in faith here today. To give everything that we have, everything that we are to our maker who loves us and promises to lead us through the Holy Spirit. So Lord, as we prepare to hear from your word, we lift this worship to you as an offering. And as we prepare to give tithes from what you've provided for us, it is just an offering to the one who we trust in completely. So take these, Lord, use them for your glory. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Church, you can take a seat. said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. Woodman. We have been studying the rise and fall of Israel's first monarch, a man named Saul. And up until this point, while it hadn't been a straight line, Saul's star had been steadily rising. Until now. Uh, Chapter 12 ended with these words of the prophet Samuel. He said, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Now, unfortunately... Instead of paying close attention to Samuel, it would seem as though Saul may have been flipping through an early released copy of Machiavelli's The Prince. Because what Saul is about to do next is more in line with the ends justify the means than they are with fearing the Lord and serving him faithfully. And as we turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13, we'll see that Saul had every opportunity to succeed. But instead, began his descent. He falls Hard, and it cost him dearly. Now, if you are new with us this weekend, whether here with me at Monument or maybe joining us at one of our other campuses, my name's Josh. I am one of the pastors here at Woodman. But before we really jump in, there's there's two things that, that I want you to know. And and the first is, we legit we are we are really very grateful to have you spend some time with us this weekend. And, and, and the second is that when this service is, is over, we hope that you're glad that you came. And I, and I say that because the passage before us, it, it is a bit of a tough one. Even for the most seasoned follower of Jesus among us. It's tough because it may seem 
like God is being overly sensitive and then as a result, unduly harsh with his punishment. And the reason we sometimes feel like that is because in our mortal flesh, it really is very difficult to comprehend, uh, to wrap our minds around the utter holiness of God. Though we are made in his image, uh, sometimes we like to think he's more like ours. Now, few of us, I suppose, uh, walked into any one of these five rooms believing that the ends justify the means. But we do sometimes functionally operate with the belief that all is well that ends well, you know? But the biblical fact of the matter is that God is very interested in our journey and the decisions we make along the way, they, they will be judged. And, and that judgment will, will very much impact our end. So if you would, I want to pray specifically that God gives us ears to hear and to understand his word today. Heavenly Father, Forgive me for the times when I have not made as much of you as I should. Uh, times when I've come to your word and, and sometimes taken it more like a suggestion. Just kind of warm, warm good thoughts to think about. Instead of the words of a holy God. Who looks to me to be righteous. Father, we thank you in advance for Jesus Christ who lived the life we could not live. We thank you that for those of us who have confessed him as Lord, when you look at us now, you see only the righteousness of Jesus. But that doesn't mean that our actions no longer matter. They still do. And so, Father, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, help me not to mess this up, and be glorified in your church, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And, and we're going to begin at verse 1. And the narrator opens by setting the stage uh, for the narrative that follows. Uh, but our text begins with something that is, is super encouraging. But it's only really super encouraging because it happens so very little. Let's just look at verse one. It says this, now Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. Now, if you're following along in the NIV, I was just reading from the ESV, you're like, my, my Bible doesn't say anything like that. The NIV says, Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. That's pretty different. And so, so what's the deal? Well, I don't know if this ever happened to you. You ever come across something, a file on your computer, you try to open it, and then you're told like it's a corrupted file. Now, that's about as far as my IT knowledge goes, but I've had the experience, right? This... 1 Samuel 13, verse 1, this is a corrupted verse. And, and what you have in the ESV, what you have in the NIV, what you have in any translation is the translator's best attempt to fix the corrupted file. Something clearly got dropped. And the best guess is it's, it's some numbers. Uh, but it happened like really right out of the gate. 
most of the Greek translations of the Old Testament, they don't even include verse 1. It's not even there. They got to it. They're like, this, this is messed up. And they just went to verse 2. And, but it does give you a little insight into, into how translators in these different versions, when they come to these things, are trying to figure it out. Uh, the ESV thinks what the author was trying to communicate was, if you've been with us, you know that Saul didn't become king overnight. He was kind of privately anointed, and then there was that public introduction, and then he was presented before God. They think that the author's trying to say that whole thing took a year. Saul lived for a year, and then he was king, and then two years later came the events we're about to look at. Translators of the NIV are like, no, this is probably more like the introduction to kings you see time and time again throughout the Old Testament where it tells you the king was such and such age and he reigned for such and such a time. But the numbers aren't there, so they had to look at other parts of Scripture to kind of fill it in. You go, so why is this super encouraging? Well, if you are one of the ones that have been with me the almost 10 years I've been at Woodman, how often do you ever hear me say we need to address a corrupted verse? I'm I'm sure I have, maybe, but I, I cannot remember a time. With the thousands and thousands and thousands of verses we've got, it happens so, so, so rarely that something Something got missed. A scribe sneezed on it. Who knows? We don't. What's encouraging is that God has preserved his word. So much so that the corrupted verses are few and far between. What we've got clearly is the narrative that follows. We read in verse 2. Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. Uh, 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. Now, the rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Now, Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it said that Saul had defeated the garrison garrison of the Philistines and that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. Now, if you have been with us, you you know this, this is what the people were wanting. This is what they had been looking forward to. They wanted an earthly king. And now finally they're getting themselves a national security strategy. They got a king and he's putting together an army. This is what, this is what they wanted. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 20, they said that may we be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And they're living their dream. This is Israel's first standing army. 3,000 strong. 2,000 of them were with Saul in a place called Michmash awesome name, which is about seven miles northeast of Jerusalem. And his son, Jonathan, had the other thousand in Saul's hometown of Gibeah. Now, what happens next, though it is clear, is maybe not as clear as we'd like it to be. We're told that Jonathan and his a thousand attack and defeat this small garrison of the Philistines. Now, word spread that not Jonathan, but Saul, the new king, was taking care of business and that the Philistines weren't too happy about it. Consequently, it says that the Israelites had become a stench to them. What's a little curious, and and you don't want to read into it, and certainly we don't want to make too much of it because we're not told, but it is a little weird that It's Jonathan, Saul's son, 
and not Saul, the new king that's leading the battle. It's also a little curious that we don't have any record of Saul telling Jonathan to do this. And actually, there's no record of any of them consulting God and asking God if this is something that we should even go and do. The thing to remember, though, this is in large part what Saul was there to do. When he was anointed king in 1 Samuel 10, 1, Samuel said to him, has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. Put, put that in the back of your head. God has explicitly told Saul that Saul will save his people from their enemies. But just like you and I do sometimes, Saul seemingly doesn't take God at his word as everybody is shocked at what happens next. Look at verse five. It says, and the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth-Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Now, a lot of biblical scholars question the idea that there could have been 30,000 Philistine chariots. I mean, if so, it would have been the largest army ever amassed. In, I mean, it's just, it's just massive. So much so, you're like, well, my Bible, the NIV, doesn't say 30. Right, yours says 3,000. They, they sort of adjusted down because they're like something, something got messed. Now, the thing is, the point of the author is that the Philistine army was huge. It was massive. There are thousands and thousands of them. And, and what gets in our head is that we tend to treat numbers particularly uh, very different than, than Old Testament authors did. Right? If you're told by someone, hey, here's such and such a job. If you do this job, it's going to take you a while. I'm going to pay you $50,000. But then you do the job and they give you forty two. You're, you're looking for some, some cash, right? You, you owe me, you would say. And if they told you, well, I just meant 50-ish, that wouldn't quite, oh, okay, then never mind. In the Old Testament, a lot of times with numbers, it, it wasn't an issue of truthfulness as it was a matter of precision, right? The author is not claiming to have stood with his binoculars and an abacus and counting every single Philistine that he saw. What he's saying is there were like thousands of chariots, there were thousands of horsemen, and then the soldiers? Forget about it. Like the, like the sand on a seashore. So much so, the Israelites, they freak out. They hid themselves in caves and in holes, in rocks, in tombs, and in cisterns. And some even fled the border and jumped to Canada. Not Canada exactly, but they went across the Jordan. They went across the Jordan, the border, to get away. And the question becomes, and it's something we talked about months ago when I was referencing planes, trains, and automobiles. But, but the question becomes, what did you think was going to happen, Israel? I mean, in your mind, you envisioned having a king that would lead you into battle, but apparently against an enemy that you thought would never fight back. You wanted the Philistines out. You applauded when they defeated the garrison. But now you're surprised they're retaliating. Have you ever made the same mistake? 
I mean, the, the apostle Peter warns us to not be surprised when fiery trials come upon us. And in his case, he was legit meaning fiery trials. But, but are you ever sort of taken aback when things don't go the way that you thought they should go? I mean, Jesus tells us, right? He says that the world will hate us, exclude us, revile us, spurn our names as evil on account of him. But does it ever catch you off guard when it plays out like that? When someone doesn't like you because of your faith in Jesus? It's easy to say to the Israelites, what were you thinking? Of course they were going to attack. But we should be saying the same thing to us when we find following Jesus to be difficult. Because Jesus told us it sometimes would be. And if you are here, and if you are envisioning a life with Jesus that frees you from the trials of this world, you need to choose whether you want Jesus or to be free from the trials because you really can't have both. Following Jesus is often very hard. And it will put you at odds with others which is why it's so important for us to come and to gather together to encourage one another because this is hard to do by yourself. You would think that Saul and the Israelites would have been ready. Uh, they, they should have been prepared. They, they should have been confident but, but they're anything but. And Saul, Saul doesn't handle it well. And, and, and we see his sin. Look at the second half of verse seven. It says, Saul was still at Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. Now, on the surface, especially if, if you're new to this stuff, hearing that or following along and reading it, it doesn't appear to be all that dramatic. But this, this, was a, this was a deal. Say, so, so what happened? Well, well, Saul directly disobeyed a commandment of the Lord. Say, say in what way? Well, it went down either one of three ways. And, and biblical scholars, they kind of debate. There was a the thing back in chapter 10 where Samuel said something really, really super similar to Saul. Told him, go to Gilgal, wait for me seven days. I'll show up on the seventh day. I'm going, I'm going to offer this burnt offering and this peace offering, and then I'm gonna tell you what to do. Now, some people think that what we're reading here in verse 13 is, is what we read about in chapter 10. Chapter 13 refers to chapter 10. Other scholars are like, actually, the distance between chapter 10 and chapter 13 could have been a very long time. It can't be the same thing. And so what they say is maybe in, in chapter 10, what's not recorded is Samuel telling Saul, this is how it's always gonna go. We'll always rally at Gilgal, give me seven days to get there. I'll show up, offer the offering, and then I'll tell you what to do. But then others still think, and I'm probably more on this page, just because Samuel told Saul something in chapter 10 doesn't mean he couldn't have told him somewhere in the middle of 13 and we just didn't write it down. The bottom line is Samuel was told to wait, Saul rather was told to wait for Samuel and Samuel was going to come and offer this burnt offering and peace offering. But Saul didn't wait. And though this may sound weird to modern ears, to disobey one of the Lord's prophets was the same as disobeying God himself. 
And before you think, well, I'm sure glad we don't have to listen to prophets anymore, remember that to disobey the words of this book is to disobey God himself. But for some reason, myself, and I think a lot of us, find this book sometimes easy to disregard. Did you ever do that? I'm not a betting man, but I would guess if you're on your way home after this service and, and a police cruiser got behind you and turned on flashing lights, the majority of y'all, you're, you're pulling over. If you're on a plane and the attendant tells you to put your tray up and it's full locked and upright position and, and pull your seatbelt tight and low across your waist, the majority of us are gonna do it. And if your employer says, we really want you here by 8.30 in the morning, we're not making it a habit of showing up at 10. When, when we're given instruction by those in authority, for the most part, the people of God, you say the world doesn't do that. No, I'm talking about us. We, we, we try to get in line. But then we come to the book that the God we worship wrote and we see things clearly in black and white. I won't say we. And I don't always do what the book says. Are you with me? Is there something that you need to get after? Something that God has told you you need to be doing and you're not? Is there something like Saul you need to wait on? Are you wrestling with this temptation to take matters into your own hands, but you need to stand down and be patient? Saul blows through the guardrail and does his thing. And here is his defense, verse 10. It says, as soon, as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I've not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. If you go over it this week, like I've been pouring over it many times this week, it actually is really quite embarrassing. And what's the worst is I know I've acted similarly myself at times. Notice that Saul does not initially give this, he didn't seem to think this is going to be a huge problem. He offers up the burnt offering and then Samuel appears, and Saul goes running to him to greet him. You don't get the vibe that he thinks he's about to get his hands up. No, he just goes out like, Samuel, you're here. And maybe Samuel, seeing the smoke still rising from the offering, a look of horror on his face, doesn't even address Saul's greeting. He just says, what have you done? What have you done? But Saul doesn't break. He just responds like confidently. He said, what do you, what do you mean, what did I do? The people, the people have been scattering, okay? And you... Where have you been? So the Philistines are mustered. They could come at any time. And I realized, because you hadn't been around, that we were about to go into battle and nobody had sought the favor of the Lord. 
Now, the ESV has Saul saying that he forced himself, almost like, he, oh, I didn't want to, but I just, I had to. But the NIV has it better. Their translation says that Saul felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Samuel saying to Saul, what have you done? And Saul's like, what did you think I would do? What could I have done? You were here, they were running, I took care of business and I got it done. I didn't have much of a choice. Now there are several things that could be said, but maybe the simplest is the most important. Do not, if you take nothing else from this, just stick with me on this one. Do not ever think that you will please God while at the same time disobeying his word. Never think that you will be able to somehow please God while at the same time disobey his word. It is ridiculous that they realize they are going to be in a very real physical battle and that they are outnumbered. They want to have the Lord's favor on that battle and the way they're going to seek his favor is by doing something God asked them not to do. It's crazy. And I kind of half wonder if Samuel held back just to see what Saul would do. Isn't it a little crazy that it seems like no sooner had Saul offered this offering that that's when Samuel showed up? And Saul could have done something different. How cool would it have been if Samuel showed up kind of walking behind Saul as Saul was like, okay, y'all know, let's just be on, I'm new to this. And we, we are jammed up. Lots of people are leaving. Samuel, I have no idea where he is. And um, there's the army. And um, we can't do the offering thing because Samuel ain't here. <laughs> and so stand up. Let's, we need to pray. Should, should we pray? Can someone pray? We need to pray. We need God to do something. Lord, I'm between a rock and a hard place. What? Can I do? But Samuel didn't find Saul like that. Samuel found Saul doing the thing he was explicitly told not to. And Saul doesn't seem to recognize what a deal this is. It's as if Saul, pardon the expression, he he thinks he's above the law. And even with God's prophet standing in front of him, asking him what he had done, Saul never breaks. Don't ever think you can please God while at the same time, disobey his word. You cannot do it. I wonder if some of us are trying to. Saul is about to pay dearly for his indiscretion. Here's the consequence, verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. 
They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. Now, biblically speaking, it's the fool who says in his heart, there is no God. So to accuse someone of acting foolishly in Old Testament Israel was a, was a far greater slam in their culture than, than it may be regarded in our own. But what is the consequence that Saul is about to face because of his sin? The consequence is if he had not sinned, his throne would have descended to his son and his son's son after him. But because of Saul's sin, that has been broken. There will be no hereditary monarch descending from Saul or his family line. And Samuel tells him there could have been. But then comes the actually really stinging part Samuel said that the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Now this is a reference, as some of us will probably know, to David, who will succeed Saul. But what the Hebrew says, literally, is, is, is quite powerful. It, it actually says the Lord sought for himself a man according to his own heart. The point being God is making a statement not so much about David's heart as he's making a statement about his own. It's like God is telling Saul, listen, you know the people chose you. They wanted a king to be like the other nations because they wanted a king to take him into battle. And then they saw you and you looked the part. You're strappingly tall and built and handsome. And you are exactly what the people wanted. And I went with it. But now I'm going to pick who I want. And I want someone different than you, Saul. I'm looking for a different kind of prince over my people. And it's not a guy like you. And what kills me, and I've been thinking about this all week, going through iterations, thinking how I could make this point actually land. But here we are at the end, and I have to imagine that some of you are probably still thinking, it seems a bit heavy-handed for having lit a fire. You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but did you kind of think, hey, the people were scattering and Samuel didn't text and the army was right there and all Saul had ever seen was the Lord's favor being entreated through these offerings and so yeah, should he have done it? No, but to lose it like this? And if that kind of thinking is going through your head, I'm telling you, that's not coming from God. But it's coming straight from the one that said, it's just a piece of fruit. What could be the big deal? You see, that's the one common thread between Adam, Eve, and Saul. Each knew what God had said, and each thought they knew better. And they would suffer the consequences for that thinking. Is there a chance you're doing the same thing? And I'm not even thinking about the sins that we do that frankly we don't even recognize we did. Right? There's things that we're not sure about. There's things that just happen. We do it, and then afterwards, maybe, we don't even know until someone points it out. I'm talking about things that we know, things that he said, things that we understand, but that we don't care. It's a dangerous 
dangerous place to be. And look, Jesus did not come to this earth, experience hunger and, and, and cold. He, he didn't face the cruel mocking torment of those that he created and suffer the scorn and excruciating pain of the cross. If a simple slap on our hand would have done the trick. No, Jesus died for us because only a perfect sacrifice could offset the judgment of a holy God. And every sin we callously commit is one that he had to pay for with his blood. He died... Because our sins, our disobedience was so great. And he wanted to save us from ourselves and to give us new life by sharing his life with us. I'll leave you with two things. A question and sort of an encouragement. And the question is, are are you testing God by disobeying his word? When we knowingly sin and persist in sin, we are in effect saying, stop me. And that's a dangerous thing to do. And I wonder if you need to just embrace the gospel, maybe for the first time to confess him as Lord. Maybe for what feels like the millionth time to recognize, unlike Saul, yes, I did fall short and I did the thing I didn't want to do again. I don't do the things I want to do. Thank you for your grace and mercy. I am in the wrong. Forgive me, please, and cleanse me. But then here's the encouragement. And it's not something you often hear at church. But maybe Machiavelli was sort of right. And I do think that the end, singular, does justify the means. That is, as followers of Jesus, with glory in eternity, with Jesus forever. With the reward that is ours through his death, burial, and resurrection. There is nothing here on earth that is worth jeopardizing that end. And no matter what I need give up or what I need embrace, if God says it, I should want it for myself. Do you want it for you? Or does something need to change? Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is surreal, but that you would send your Son to die for us when we were yet still sinners. That living on this side of the cross and recognizing that, that we still could be tempted, we still do fall. Forgive us. Lord, we pray that our lives demonstrate our faith. We pray that our behavior points to the one we obey. We ask, Father, that you would be magnified through our actions, that the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up in how we conduct ourselves. Be magnified in us, we ask. Amen. Amen. Church, would you stand with us as we close with a song that's really a prayer, asking Jesus to be glorified in our lives. Thank you.
strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I rejoice because you're the two. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast. choice really similar to Saul's. There's no question that we all fail, and, and um, ironically for myself, I think the first thing that comes out is my inner defense attorney, right? Um, it was somebody else that made me do that, right? It was um, the circumstances. It presented itself, and it was so much easier. And in the end, that's magnifying me and I think we all just sang that we would like Christ to be magnified in us. And a response that magnifies Christ is to say, wow, I did not live up to that. But because of what you did, I can be justified. Acknowledging what he's done for us magnifies him. It's easy for us to think on this side of the cross, like, what are we commanded to do? You know, he, he said in Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you can't do the second without doing the first. And I fail at the first so often. But... I can turn and be reminded what he did on the cross, acknowledge it to him, and magnify him that way. That's humbling, but I think we're called to be humble. We're so glad you're here with us. Go away encouraged because you've got a Savior who loves you. And if you don't have that Savior yet, he would love for you to join the family. If you've got anything that we could pray for you about, there'll be pastors and leaders up front. We'd encourage you to come up. It would be our privilege to pray with you. But before you go into the rest of your week, let me read this over you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Amen.